Hey, real estate investors, welcome to module five, making offers, the conversation. In this module, we're going to talk about how you make offers on properties, what you need to make those offers, and how to just deal with the conversation of an offer. Now, I call it a conversation because that's really all it is. There's a back and forth, and, it's, and it should be comfortable. It should be a comfortable conversation. Now, you're going to have it in writing, obviously, but you have to be comfortable knowing that there's going to be responses back and forth. Don't take anything personal. It's all a conversation. Now, we've already covered your market that you want to be in, uh, how to get the deals into your inbox, uh, how to run your numbers. So really, it's you're at the point where you got to start making offers. Remember, if you want that inbox to overflow, you have to make offers because that keeps the deals coming in. It keeps your realtors and your wholesalers bringing you more deals because they know you are serious. And it's a scary thing for a lot of new investors to make that first offer. And I get it. I understand it. The the, the first offer, you're thinking, you know, whether it's a $50,000 house or a million dollar house, you're, you, you feel like you're on the hook for that money now, but you're not. The offers don't put you on the hook for the money. You have time. We're going to talk about your due diligence timeframes, the time you have for inspections and to, to make sure that the deal really is a deal. But you don't get these deals unless you make offers. You have to pull that trigger. Even though it's scary, it can be exciting. Uh, there's a whole bundle of emotions you'll go through when you press that first button to send that offer out. Um, just do it. Make it happen. That's how you do this business. You have to make offers. You're not going to get a property if you don't make offers. You can't flip a house without having a house. So you got to make the offers. It's scary. It's okay. Enjoy it. So once you've determined the market you want to be in, the first thing you should do once you start connecting with realtors is have one of them send you a copy of the residential purchase agreement. Uh, the, the realtors in any market have a, a standard a real estate purchase contract that they use, the RPA, Residential Purchase Agreement. And get a copy of that so you can read it ahead of time before you're even making your offer. That way you can look at it. And if you have any questions, any verbiage that you don't understand, you can ask them about it. What does this mean in this paragraph? But get a copy of it so that when it's time to actually make your offers, when you have that deal, you want to make an offer, you're not spending three days of back and forth trying to figure out what the wording on the contract really means. So get a copy of a blank RPA, Residential Purchase Agreement, and review it. You want to review everything everything you sign, read everything you sign, whether it's a purchase agreement, loan docs, whatever, read everything. So there's, there's a number of things that you're going to need when you're making an offer. And it's, it starts with the property address. You're going to be looking at a lot of addresses from a lot of different people. Some realtors might send you 50 deals before you find one that you're going to make the offer on. And when you respond to them, you got to let them know which one it is. You guys, so the, the property address, uh, purchase price, buyer name, earnest money uh, deposit amount, your days of due diligence, your closing date, contingencies, title company, purchasing type, loan, proof of funds, everything. It sounds like a lot, but it really isn't. It can be really simple. And we actually have a uh, document for you that you can just copy the verbiage out of, paste it into an email, and plug in the missing information the, the, the street address, things like that, and just send that over in an email form. That's what you do. So let's, let's really get into this, and we'll go through these uh, 10 items I just listed through. The property address, really straightforward. Put the property address so the realtor knows who you're, uh, what property you're talking about, whether it's the realtor or the wholesaler. And I like to put, whenever I'm emailing somebody on, on a property, I put property address, so I'll do, I'm not the whole address, but I'll do... Um, 1712 Owens cash offer. I put that right in the subject line of my email. Gets people excited. They say, oh, cash offer. I got I to gotta open this thing up and see what it says. So I put that, but it's also so that I can track things easier and keep track of uh, if I have to do a search in my email for everything on Owens, I just type in Owens and I want that subject line to always have that property address in there. So it's just 
saves time the more organized you are. Purchase price. You've ran your numbers on the property and you know that you can do a max offer price of $87,391.27. But we're not robots, so we're not going to put that, you know, $1,000 increments, 87000 or 88000 whatever you want to do there. But $1,000 increments, it makes you seem more real. And the calculator is going to help you get these max offer prices. And I, I, there's going to be a give and take. It's a conversation. Offer a little below. Expect them to come back and ask for more. They, it's silly when they don't do it, but um, you know, be ready for it. If you offer eighty-four thousand or eighty-five thousand on this one, and they come back at ninety, well, guess what? Where's the middle middle round in, uh, in that one? Eighty-seven thousand. The numbers still work for you. It's negotiations. Everyone's got to give and take on negotiations. You want everybody to feel feel a little bit bad. And a little bit good on a negotiation. It's kind of the way it works. Buyer name. Now on this one, the way I buy my properties, I buy them in an LLC. So I have multiple LLCs in different states, ways I, I purchase properties, but it's an LLC with an S designation. Now that's a bunch of tax lingo as far as the S designation, things like that. And like I've said before, I'm not a lawyer. I'm not a CPA. Uh, I'm not the 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 go-to expert on that. We each come from a different background. We're in different states. We have different tax structures. So you're really going to want to go and talk to your your CPA or your attorney and find out what they think is going to be best for you. But buying in your personal name is not the safest way to do it. When I first started off, I was buying everything in my personal name. I didn't get hurt. Nobody came after me personally for lawsuits or anything like that. But if you buy an LLC or an S-Corp or a trust or a land trust, all these different entities, if you buy in one of those, you have more protection for yourself personally, for the entity that you're buying in, and also for your private investors. So I highly recommend you talk to your CPA or a real estate attorney and find out what they suggest is best for your individual um, uh level of uh, uh, investing. Earnest money deposit, EMD. I like to do $5,000 increments. Even if they're only asking for $1,000, I'm going to offer $5,000 because it makes my offer stronger. Okay. Now, if they not, I'm not on the hook right away for this $5,000. You have to remember that. Once they accept your offer, you usually have two days to turn your EMD in to whoever the uh, escrow company is. Sometimes it's a realtor, sometimes it's a, a real estate attorney or a, a title, um, um, title or escrow company. So I do it in $5,000 increments. And the way I do it in the contract, $5,000 to be wired. Always wire your EMD. In our modern world, it just makes sense. I know there's guys out there still teaching to to get a blank copy of a check and you just, every offer you're writing out there, you just put a new note on that copy of a check. It's a crazy system. It takes way too much time. Don't do copies of checks. Just wire the money. It's easy. There's a checkbox on these residential purchase agreements, money to be wired. Now your due diligence time frame. This is the important part. Your due diligence is when you're doing your inspections, you're getting your contractors out there to quote the job. I always ask for 10 days. I want enough time to do my inspections and get my contractor quotes. I'm Remember, we're not going out to these properties before we put the offer in. We're putting our offer in sight unseen. We're looking at the pictures on the MLS and, and taking a look at that. But this is your time to do a lot of different things, securing your money, uh, making sure your ARV is correct, getting your contractors out there. It's it's important. Now, in hot markets, you might uh, have realtors say, oh, if you if you put zero days due diligence, it's going to be a much stronger offer. If you're going to do that, make sure you've done all of your due diligence beforehand. Okay, Be safe. Due diligence gives you outs, ways to get out of the contract. If you find something during your inspections you don't want to close on the property, or you have to go for a different price, that's the time to do it. So don't do the zero days unless you've done your due diligence. That's the same thing with wholesalers. 
if you're getting deals from wholesalers, a lot of times you don't have any due diligence time frame. So you have to do it before you write your contract. Closing time frame, I typically put 20 days on my contracts. And it's it's going to be better than a, you know, Joe and, J- Joe and Jane home buyer coming in and offering 30 to 45 days for a traditional loan. Faster close, value of money, uh, it, it works. 20 days should be plenty of time. You get d- your due diligence done, and then you get everything else lined up along the way. Uh, 20 days to close. It's a strong offer. It's a strong time frame, and that's, uh, that's the way you want to go about it. And again, these time frames start once you receive written notification of your offer being accepted. If they accept your offer on Friday, but they don't let you know about it until next Wednesday, Wednesday is the day when your time frames actually start. They don't steal four or five days from you. Contingencies. Contingencies are on a normal contract. If you have a, uh, a Joe and Jane home buyer and they want to, uh, they, they're saying, my offer is contingent on me qualifying for a loan of $180,000. That's a contingency. It makes an offer weaker. Less contingencies makes your offer stronger. So I tell them up front, I don't have any appraisal contingencies or loan contingencies. Now, I'm not ordering an appraisal and I'm not getting a traditional loan, so I don't lose anything by saying that, but it makes my offer look stronger. And you want your offer to look as strong as possible. But we do want to be contingent on inspection. This is what you do during your due diligence. If you find something, you can get out of the contract if you don't want to do it. If you find mold or heavy termite damage or you know, a number of other things that could possibly happen. It's, uh, you want to have outs on the contract. Typically, in most RPAs, the realtor contracts, there's going to be a few ways to get out of them. Talk to your realtor about that for your individual markets that you're in. But there's going to be little ways to get uh, that you can say, well, you, know, you, got, you guys didn't do that, so we're backing out of the contract. Just safe ways where you can still get your EMD. Because if you go past your due diligence time frame and then try to cancel, a lot of times you're saying goodbye to your earnest money deposit, and you don't want that. Title, escrow company, or attorney, uh, depending on what what part of uh, the country you're in, what state you're in, there's different uh, ways to close properties. If you don't have a preferred one, just use who who your realtor recommends. They're going to have people that they've worked with. Work with them once. If you like them, keep working with them. If you didn't like them, then you tell your realtor the next time around, hey, I don't want to use them again. They were awful. Their paperwork was all messed up. They made me wait for three hours, whatever the case is. Now, most of these companies will give investors discounts because they want repeat business, but you don't get it if you don't ask for it. And just like anything, whether you're dealing with realtors, contractors, handymen, uh, title companies, um, you know, you know, a kid shoveling your uh, driveway for the snow, whatever the case is, I like to say, is that the best you can do when they give me a price or give me a discount? And a lot of times they're going to come down a little on pricing. Uh, They're going to give you a little bit more. So is that the best you can do? Remember that phrase. It's going to save you thousands and thousands of dollars over the course of your career. Now your purchase type We always say cash purchase as is. That means we're not asking for any repairs. We're buying it as it sits right then and there, and it's cash. Now, even if you're going to get a hard money loan or a private investor, it's still cash. It's not your cash. It's somebody else's cash. But when we're making the offer, because we want it to be as strong as possible, we are saying cash purchase. Proof of funds, the POF. Now, If you have a proof of funds and you have money in your account, you should have enough to cover the purchase price plus a little extra. And I typically want to see another 10% or more on there because it shows if if you're offering $180,000 on a house and your account only has $180,000, you know there's closing costs. There's going to be additional things. They're going to say, well, that's not that strong. But if you have $200,000 in there, that's going to look better. Now, a lot of people think, well, they see I have two hundred or three hundred or four hundred thousand in there. They're going to ask for a higher price. They might, but don't worry about that. Stick to your price. That's what it is. And it doesn't have to be your account. So I know some of you don't have money. 
uh, you're, you're new to this business, you're new to real estate investing, and, and you don't have funds yet, the proof of funds does not have to be in your name. You can have a proof of funds of you know, your, your mom and dad or, or Jim, the private investor, or uh, there's companies online that sell uh, proof of fund services, and they typically all they need is a letter with that proof of funds saying that you have access to that money for this property. Nice and easy, simple. It works. I've used these kind of things before many times. Now you send your offer through email, and you in uh, this case we're sending it to the realtor, and we're going to tell them. I want to make an offer on property located at 321 Sesame Street. Here are the terms. And I just list these items that we just went through. I attach my proof of funds and I tell them, please send for e-signatures as soon as possible. We went to all the trouble to let them know we want to make an offer. We don't want them to send it in a day or two. We want to do it now. We want our offer in to the, 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 the seller's hands. And the e-signatures, there's a lot of different companies out there where you can do electronic signatures. That's what an e-signature is, where you can just sign it through your email. Um, AuthentiSign, DocuSign, and there's a few other ones. You don't care which one it comes over in, as long as the realtor knows how to do it. Again, you don't want your realtor driving all the way across town after they drop their kids off at uh, soccer practice and trying to get wet signatures on the actual paperwork. Tell them just to email it over to you. You'll get it signed immediately and get your offer in. It can be it can be real scary making that first offer. And that's okay. You know, enjoy those feelings. But remember, it's just a conversation. Now, I want you making an offer a day. One offer a day, that's 30 offers on average a month. If each of those offers is let's say $100,000, that's $3 million in property that you're you're on the hook for? No. If none of those offers get accepted, you're not on the hook for anything. Even if they do get accepted, you have your due diligence time frame where you can get in and out of those deals at your choice. If you get multiple offers accepted, you know what? Go to that, the best one and say no thank you to the other ones or even wholesale those off to other investors if you, if you can't close on them yourself. It's, if it's too much, if you're overwhelmed. But you're not on the hook for those right away. Now, when you make your offer, you're going to get some a varying degree of responses from the sellers. Uh, they might not even respond at all. They, they, you send your offer. Don't just sit there and wait. You know, it's, it, 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 they'll respond when they want or if they don't. Don't worry about it because you're going to make more offers. You're going to analyze more deals. So no answer, um, not a big deal. Sometimes they'll just decline it outright and they'll say, uh, they'll uh, send a rejection uh, uh, form over to you saying an offer has been uh, rejected. Or they'll uh, call your realtor and say, thanks, but no thanks, we went with another offer. That's all fine. As long as we get some kind of notification from it, that's good. Uh, they might accept it as it is and say, wow, we get, you know, we'll take it. That's when you get your party started and you start on your due diligence. But more often than not, you're going to get a counter offer. And that's just part of the conversation going back and forth. They might say, well, instead of 10 days of due diligence, we'll give you five. Or instead of closing in 20, we want you to close in 15. Or instead of 180, we want 184. It's all a conversation going back and forth. But remember, you can counter their counter. It's okay. I've, I've had ones that go all the way up to like seven counters back and forth. It's crazy. And, you know, but he's, some people just get real nitpicky on some of the minutia of a deal. But the numbers still have to work for you no matter what. So offer gets accepted. Now what do you do? Your due diligence starts now. Get to work. Drop what you're doing. This is the most important thing in your life at that point. Your offer is accepted. You're on the clock. You have 10 days to do what? Your top two priorities, schedule your contractors, multiple ARV opinions. All right? These due diligence items, the ARV from three realtors. I want to really make sure that my ARV is right. I've already looked at it, when it to make my offer. I got it from my first realtor. And now, because I've already connected with other realtors, I'm going to call up Jane and say, hey, Jane, I've got this property under contract. Could, could you take a look at it for me? I, I want to know what you think I could sell it for. And could you send me over some comps that you, you think are the, the best ones for it? 
And I'm not looking for the realtor who's going to give me the highest list price. I just want your honest opinion on it. Am I getting into a good deal? So if you could send that over to me today or tomorrow, I'd really appreciate it. You just get that uh, from a couple of realtors. And guess what? If they say no, if that realtor says, no, you know what? I'll, I'll, I'll do it, but only if you promise me the listing. That realtor is not looking out for you. Kick them to the curb and move on to the next one. Okay. There, that should be, yeah, you know, yeah, Bob, I'll do that for you. No problem. I'll have that to you this afternoon. It's, it's a relationship business and you want people that are looking out for you. Now, the three quotes from the contractors. We'll, in the contractor module, we'll go through a lot of this, but just know that it's not just calling up three contractors and sending them over to the house. You're probably going to have to send 10 over. I have this 10 to 3 rule. It's just kind of the way it works with contractors. Uh, some of them won't show up. Some of them won't send you a quote. Some of them will get scared by the project or, or whatever the case is, or they'll just flake out. But you'll end up getting about three quotes for every 10 contractors you send to the, send to the property. It's, it's a, the way that business works. Now, this is the time when you also want to walk the property and get your pictures. And I'm not just talking one or two pictures of the house. I'm talking 100 pictures. We're, these are digital pictures. Take as many as you want. Take some video, but make sure you get pictures. And the way I get my pictures, I get two from every side of the house, front, back, left, right. I get a couple extra shots of the roof from both the front and back. Any mechanical systems, heating, cooling, electric panel, water heater. I want pictures of all of those. When I'm taking pictures of rooms, I'm taking one kitty corner from each other. So every room I have at least two photos. And as I'm going through, I'm taking pictures underneath every sink because there's always hidden damage underneath the sinks. And any damage that I see in the house, I take pictures. But I don't take pictures from all the way across the room, I take them close up. And depending on what it is, I might even put a reference object in the picture. I might hold up a pen next to a, a hole in the wall so I can see that it's only the size of a quarter or something like that. Uh, but take a ton of pictures, whether it's you or if you're doing it remotely and it's your boots on the ground or your realtor out there that's doing it for you, um, make sure they get plenty of photos. And you don't want your boots on the ground or realtor to text those pictures to you or email them to you in like a, a 20 different emails and then you have to download them. You want to use a program like Google Docs or Dropbox.com so they can just send you a folder with all those pictures in it nice and easy. During your due diligence, you also have to get your funding secured. Okay, Remember, you have 10 days. You have to get all of this done in 10 days. To get your funding secured, if you're using private investors, you probably have to uh, send them an investment package where it shows what, what the deal is that they're getting into. So you're going to use some of those pictures in there. And then three quotes on insurance. So you know what you're going to be uh, paying for your insurance on the property. Now, the type of insurance that we get on our properties is builder's risk vacant policy. Sounds a little complicated, but all you have to do is call your insurance providers. And we use the major insurance providers for this because we want to make sure I mean, we're not going to try to save $200 on insurance at the risk of some low level insurance company that doesn't pay out, not paying us out a claim if we have to ever use it. So things, uh, State Farm, Allstate, Farmers, all, all those big name insurance companies, you call them up, tell them what you're doing. I'm buying a house. It's, it's a bit of a mess right now. I'm going to fix it up. I'm never going to live in it. And then I'm going to sell it. What type of insurance do I need? Each one of them calls it a little bit different, but builders risk vacant policy. Now, after your due diligence, if your numbers look good, keep moving forward. But if they don't look good, what do you do? Do you just run away and say, no, thank you? I, I'll ask for a price reduction. I'll go back to them. If I found 15000 more in repairs, I'll say, hey, I can't pay 200000 for this house due to the extent of the damage that we discovered. However, I can pay 185000 And you know, you do this during your due diligence time frame. If it goes past your due diligence, guess what? They could still keep your EMD. So the way I word it in this case, I'll also add, if seller does not accept, then this is notification of cancellation. That way it covers me all in one and I don't go past my due diligence time frame. If it goes past, they haven't said anything, I assume that they've canceled and I start asking for my EMD back. So 
the conversation. What else is going to happen? You, one of the most important things about this conversation, it's not just one-on-one. -on -one. You're doing this through realtors, and you want to also hold your realtor accountable. So make sure you get the dates, the end dates of this conversation from your realtor. You want to know, when does my due diligence end? When do I have to close? Have them let you know, based on the contract and the time of acceptance, those dates. Get it in writing from them. Because if you try to cancel on February 11th, but they come back and say, no, no, your due diligence was up on February 10th, we're keeping your EMD. But your realtor told you uh, you had until February 11th and it was in writing. Guess who's responsible for that? The realtor is. So it's just another little safety net that you can have. So as soon as that offer is accepted, you know, the, you know, be excited, first of all, of getting an offer accepted, right? Do a little celebration, give yourself a high five, whatever. Um, but then you got to get right into this. And that's when the realtor will call you or email you. You want to email them back and ask for these dates. When does my due diligence end? When do I have to close by? And then you get on the phone, get in the contractors out there, asking your other realtors for the ARVs. Um, if you're moving forward with the deal, you got to coordinate with your money people, whether it's a hard money lender or a private investor, you got to get them wire instructions, connect them with the company that's actually going to do the closing. You want to schedule your t utilities to be turned on the day after closing or the day of closing. And a lot of utility companies might take a week or two to get their, get you on the schedule. So once you've passed your due diligence that day 10 and you say, yeah, I'm buying this house, everything looks good, schedule your utilities. And then you, after you've got your contractor quotes, you want to let them know once you know you're moving forward, say, hey, Mr. Contractor, I'm closing on the 20th. Can you start on the 21st? Because remember, every day that house is sitting, it's costing you money. You want them working as soon as possible. Get your insurance secured. And the most important thing before you close on a house, do your final walkthrough. Okay. It's important. You might walk the property, um, you know, day one, then day 20, when you're supposed to close, you go back out there and Hey, guess what? Day 19, half the property burned down. You know what? Nobody told you if you would have closed, you would have been responsible. I had this happen to me. Okay. This kind of stuff does happen. Squatters move in. You have to do your final walkthrough. All right. We, uh, you know, if the house is not in the same condition that it was when you originally signed your contract, the, the conversation is continuing. It's new negotiations on what the price should be or if it extends escrow. Uh, all, all of that plays into it. But it's on a case by case basis. It's important you do that final walkthrough prior to closing. Got to make your offers and keep track of them. So we have a spreadsheet where we keep track of all of our properties we're making offers on. If somebody says, if they reject my offer, I'll look at that property in two weeks. And if it's still active, I'll resubmit my offer and say, hey, you know what? You still haven't sold it. Here's my offer again. I'm still interested. Now, offers don't only have to be on the residential purchase agreement. If you're doing it with a wholesaler, making offers with them, a lot of times it's going to be text or a uh, email, or a uh, just a vocal, hey, I'll give you 120 for the property. Okay, that can count to your 30 a month, your one a day offers. If you're running numbers on properties, make the offers. It trains the people you're working with on how your numbers work and how your systems work. Uh, and let let everybody know what you're doing. The more people that know what you're doing. The, the more chance you have of bringing in deals, bringing in investors. So on social media, if you go into a, a particularly nasty house, you know, take a couple photos and post it on Instagram or Facebook and just say, oh, check out this flip I'm looking at buying. You know, something, something like that. Uh, it, you know, that stuff builds traction. It, it builds um, your credibility. And most importantly, on these offers, keep track of your dates. Like I said, with the realtor, have them send you what your dates are in writing. Wayne Gretzky has a quote. Sometimes it's attributed to uh, Michael Jordan. Uh, you will miss 100% of the shots you don't make, right? In real estate, you're going to miss 100% of the offers 
you don't make. You have to make offers to do this business. Get out there, analyze these deals, and make these offers. It's exciting. You're making your offers. The business is moving. You feel scared. You feel excited. Get accepted. You know, give yourself a high five. Make this business happen, and you make it happen by making offers. And when your offers get accepted, let us know about it. Let the Facebook group know about it. Let, let all these other investors know about it, because these investors can be your funders too. But we're all excited for you. Get those offers out there. Good luck, everybody. Oh, 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 oh,